Um, you guys are impressively good at just going immediately silent when the talks start. So thank you so much for doing that. That's making my job really easy. Um, JavaScript, we love buzzwords, right? Every week there's a new buzzword. It gets tiresome researching them all. So luckily, we have Tim here to explain one of the recent buzzwords for us so we don't have to go and research it. So please give a warm welcome to Tim. Thanks for that. Um, so I'm going to talk about serverless. I should probably put my things in presentation mode. I'm always paranoid my talks are going to go far too short, and I'll be finished in about a minute. So if you feel like asking questions, that's fine, because that means I'll go into the stuff you're interested in rather than the stuff I'm interested in as well. And if I feel like we are going a bit long, then I'll just say, come talk to me afterwards or something like that. I'm also going to do a bit of drawing. So I've got a document camera here, so you'll be able to see what I'm drawing as I'm talking. And that's why I've got the chair as well, because I get tired sometimes standing up all the time. And hopefully this mic doesn't fall off. It feels a little bit loose. So serverless app behind the hype. Is it too good to be true? Oh. Right. So. Serverless is often talked about as a sort of a panacea, as something that's going to solve everything. So I've got some dice here. And to start this off, I want you first to think about your current project or previous project and some problems it's got. I don't know if anyone can read that, but the problem you've probably got is your work's halted. This is the problem dice. Now I've got our root cause analysis dice. Your estimates have been ignored. And so to solve it, we've got a solution dice. It says, go agile. <laughs> Every side should say that, but there's like more funds and extra resources, change priorities, add training, and more synergy, whatever that means. <laughs> so serverless isn't going to solve your current project's problems. I'm not going to promise that. I do think serverless is awesome. It's a fantastic architecture, has lots of promise, for lots of kinds of domains, not everything. I just came off a project where for six months we built a serverless app, a single page serverless app. So the browser was doing lots of stuff in React and Redux and TypeScript and all those things people like saying. The, the server, because there's always a server somewhere, was running Dynamo Database, which is an Amazon database where you don't need to maintain a server. All of the business logic was done in Lambda functions, which are essentially little servers that start up when they need to and then shut down afterwards. You only pay for execution time. The talk yesterday went into them in a bit of depth, and we used API Gateway, another Amazon service, for third-party integrations. Our browser would call the Lambda functions directly. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why that was hard, a little bit about the tricks that came and got us that we didn't know at the beginning or that I didn't know at the beginning. Because when we started, all I knew was, I'm not going to need to patch and maintain a server, and that's fantastic, because I hate doing those tasks. At the end, I knew a bit more about the trade-offs. At a really basic level, this is how most web applications work, ignoring the browser at this stage. We have a server that gives some static files, has some business logic, responds to requests, has a database. As we scale, things get more complex. We need to have a load balancer, application firewalls, web app, common API or application server, probably an LDAP or server to do some kind of authentication, maybe a database. You're probably going to cluster your web app, maybe have three servers in a cluster and multiple data centers, and things just get more and more complex. If you have trouble reading my writing, that's normal. My writing is atrocious. Um, 
Hopefully the pen's wide enough to actually see the lines though. I'll move my chair so I can actually see the people around that side. So for serverless application, what we're essentially doing is moving the long running computations from a server you've got in a data center that you pay for into the browser. So you're getting the customer to pay for the, for the electricity to do what you need to do. And your browser has some degree of JavaScript on it. One of the first things you need to do in a serverless app is authenticate the user. I'm gonna mention too, I'll stand up and walk, my legs are already getting tired from sitting down. When we built this, we used exclusively Amazon services, AWS services. That was a decision we made at the time after looking at Google and Microsoft, mostly because of the user group support. Technically, I believe all three can provide a serverless architecture, but I haven't looked into Google or Microsoft's offering in depth. And the tricks I find may not apply to their services. They might be structured differently, but there may be related things as well. Anyway, we use Amazon. So to authenticate the user, well, first you need to give them files. So Amazon's got a file service solution, S3, simple storage solution, which went down last week. <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna press the focus lock button so my hand doesn't muck it up. So you get static HTML and JavaScript files. If you're using React, that'll then render your app in the browser and give you a nice log on screen. In JavaScript, we can call out to Amazon's Cognito service. That lets us do authentication. So you can have your own username and password store behind that. You can use Amazon's user pool service for username and passwords, or you can do OAuth to Google or Facebook or lots of other places. We use the user pool service for passwords and usernames, because then we don't need to worry about encrypting them and all of those password security issues. Who's heard of JSON Web Tokens? Cool, most people, who's used them extensively? Not so many people. So I'll do a little bit about what they are and why they're cool. When you authenticate against Cognito, you get two JWTs back. A JWT is basically some data that Amazon has signed, so when you give it back to them, they can verify the data you gave them is from them. Which means they don't need to do a token lookup in a database or anything like that because they just check the sign and look at the data. The authentication web token you get from Amazon, I believe, because I haven't looked at it, contains your Cognito identifier for that user, plus the policies saying what services that user is allowed to. This means often if you change the permissions a user has, they have to log out and log back on to see the new permissions. Or do a token refresh using the refresh token to get updated policies. That's a little catch if you're adjusting policies all the time. Anyway, once the user's authenticated from the logon screen, we can then make directly from the browser Lambda calls. And the Lambda is invoked with that Cognito identifier. So we then know who the user is in our code. We can trust the identifier and know we're giving that user's data back to them which is quite nice, and all that's done magically for us. And we talk to Dynamo Database to get data, save data, all of those kind of things. Equally, third-party integrations. Oh, just up the top of the screen. And the speaker yesterday spoke about this a little bit. Third-party integrations can come through API Gateway to a normal REST-looking URL that invoke the Lambda functions you want. API Gateway can do user authentication like Cognito. The catch is, though, the way your Lambda is invoked via API Gateway and from the browser direct going through Cognito is subtly different and the authentication token is in a different place. To find out, 
who actually invoked the API gateway, because that might be an API key or other things. Right. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a while. Oh, we, our lambdas also spoke to S3 to save and retrieve user uploaded images. All of this was TypeScript, which had the advantage that need a really long pen. Um, we could share type definitions between the server and the client and know the data was coming through with a particular structure and form. With Amazon services, everyone just says cheap as chips, but no one actually says what the prices are. So here we go. Lambda functions, 20 cents per million requests, and not much per gigabyte second of runtime. Lambda functions, you say the amount of memory you want. You can have Lambda functions run with 128 meg of memory. Some run with, I think, 1.5 gig is the maximum. A gigabyte second is a Lambda with 124 meg of memory running for one second. Your lambdas are timed per 100 milliseconds of runtime. So if your lambda has a really low amount of memory, you'll be charged less for it, but also you get fewer CPU resources, so it'll run slower. API gateway is pretty cheap. Um, logging, I didn't have enough space on the slide, but be aware there's costs for logging and retrieving logs as well. These are a whole lot cheaper than running a server. I was going to have a slide with those in there, but didn't have the time to do it. So that's kind of an overview of the architecture we were using. This is what this talks a little bit about. Lambda security, understanding what data you can trust when you're getting that Cognito ID from the browser versus an API gateway call, it's quite important to know the difference because you have to do things differently. I'll talk about that in a few slides. Power, whether you use 128 meg memory one or 1.5 gig or somewhere in between. DynamoDB, Amazon's NoSQL database where you specify your database in terms of read and writes per second rather than server size, has some nasty transactional update and query problems. Not problems, you just need to know about them to work around them. And I was going to talk about environmental configuration. So when your Lambda starts up, you know what DynamoDB table to talk to, what S3 bucket to talk to. But in the talk yesterday, it sounds like Amazon's got a lovely solution for that now. So I'm going to skip over environmental configuration because I don't think it's going to be an issue anymore. When you write a lambda, your code will look something like that code at the top. You get some data as the event, some context for the event, I can keep walking, and a callback function to call when it's done. If your lambda is invoked from the browser, coming through Cognito for the authentication, you'll find the Cognito identifier that user in the context. That's data you can trust. It's data Amazon's verified, by checking the signature on the web token and passing it to you in the context. Anything in the event you can't trust. That's the data just passed to the Lambda. That could be your code calling, it might not be. Oops. So here it's just JavaScript in the browser invoking the Lambda function. There's no reason why someone else can't write JavaScript in their browser that authenticates with Cognito in the same way and calls your Lambda function with entirely different data. API Gateway works a little differently. With API Gateway, you write some rules to transform the body of the put or get or post request and pass that through to the event. You'll also need access to the query string and the URL. They get passed through in the event. 
And because API Gateway is verifying the user, checking Cognito credentials, checking API keys, or however you have configured it, the only way to get that into your Lambda is to pass it through in the event. Let me rephrase that. The only way to get into your Lambda that I could figure out was to pass it in the event. And the event is inherently an untrusted object or block. There's actually a way, if you misconfigure API Gateway, for a malicious user using a different content type in their message to specify everything in that event. They can say content type is text slash podium. An API gateway can sometimes go, OK, I don't know the mapping rules to call the Lambda, so I'll just pass through this blob of data directly into event. So then when you get the event.context.apiid or API key, they could be given to you by the attacker rather than the ones cognita, rather than the ones API gateway have verified. So it's really important to be careful about that. Or else Kirk will come and have nasty words to you. You can also use lambdas as triggers on databases to do data processing. Because those are invoked by Amazon, you can reasonably trust all the data in there. I mentioned Lambda Power before. So these are actual measurements from a Lambda function that's called multiple times in that system when the browser code starts up. First to get customer details and then to load a whole lot of jobs. Each of those Lambda calls is a request to one database table. You can see for the 128 meg of memory Lambda, the first hit is expensive because Amazon is unpacking all your JavaScript, decompressing it, starting up Node and running the function. But they don't actually shut down the server straight away. They leave it running for about five minutes, I think. And so if the Lambda is called again within those five minutes, subsequent requests are a lot faster. If your Lambda has 1.5 gig of memory, the overhead of decompressing the JavaScript and starting up Node is negligible, because you also get more CPU resource. So this looks cool. The um, higher memory one looks much more reasonable and predictable. But you pay per gigabyte second. So the 128 meg of memory lambda is costing you, I call it one unit per 100 milliseconds of runtime. The 1.5 gig one is charging you 12 units because it's using 12 times as much memory per 100 milliseconds of runtime. So even though it looks initially like the 1.5 gig one gives us more stability, more predictability, it's also going to cost 12 times as much. And there's a range in between as well that you'll have to time and figure out for your own Lambda functions. So who has used Dynamo? A few people. Who has used, have used a NoSQL database? Most people. And SQL database? Everyone. Almost everyone. Sweet. So NoSQL is actually a class of databases. You can have column-oriented databases, which Dynamo is, document databases, I think Mongo's a document, key-value databases, graph databases, and lots of other kinds. A column-oriented one like Dynamo, you have something you can draw on. Sweet. If anyone wants to copy my slides, I have exactly one set. So DynamoDB each row has a key and a number of columns, which are essentially JSON blobs, JSON-like blobs. Each row can have completely different columns, and often they will be completely different columns. So most rows are in fact sparse. Dynamo is really good for key-based lookups really, really fast for key-based lookers. If you know that key. So if you're indexing, for example, with your key being the Cognito identifier, it's really easy in your Lambda to get the key and do the lookup in the database, get the customer's information for that table, or the particular job, or other things like that. 
if you need to query the database and you don't know the key, I need those slides with the guy with the key like yesterday. That was awesome. <laughs> if you have to do queries, grouping queries, so selecting um, the first one, doing, sorry, joining queries, selecting a join of CDs and owners to get some data, that's really expensive in Dynamo. You're paying by number of read and writes available per second. If you have to query across 10,000 rows in order to do that join, that's 10,000 read units you're going to use. So you can blow your capacity for that second very quickly. Equally grouping queries, selecting some amount. What this means is, oops, when you're deciding your data structure in the row, you kind of need to understand how your data is going to be queried so you can prepare the data for the query in advance. As an example, we were processing invoices, and we wanted to be able to query to find out just the list of invoices available for a month. That was something that had to be displayed on screen. Storing one invoice per row in Dynamo, so with the key being cognito ID and the invoice ID being a secondary part of the key, if the user had 200 invoices for that month, or 2,000, we'd blow 200 or 1,000 read units for that single query. So what we did is had a trigger on Dynamo, and if anything was inserted into that table, it would update another table with one row being the data for the month. So we could query that table. We basically did what you learn not to do at university or college or polytech. We denormalized the data. We had duplicate data all over the place to optimize for reads. Equally, it's quite nice when you're dealing with data to deal with, um, oh cool, I've got a mouse cursor. To deal with data in arrays. But if your updates you need to do are to change or delete an item in the array, doing those updates in a transactional way in Dynamo is hard. And transactional are kind of good when you're thinking about a system that can scale to billions of users. What I found was we had to store data in the database in maps. So we could say update line.ref1.amount to be this. Because you never know when you query if the thing at place three in your array is going to be the same as when you do the update. You don't have that transactional read and write um, usefulness that you have in SQL databases. So I always talk about how it's important to have your um, business objects different from your database objects and have a mapping layer in your Lambda to do that conversion. S3 is an awesome file store. You can get thousands of read and write operations per second if you're using it to store user images. There's a huge catch. S3 partitions automatically across lots of servers. But it partitions by file name prefix, so you can do queries like list all the files in this directory, rather than hash of file name. So if a whole lot of your files have the same prefix, like customer identifier, or environment, you might have a dev directory and a prod directory, the partitioning is going to work nowhere near as well as if you prepend all your files with just a hash itself or with some other kind of data. And that's something you typically find out after you've developed, figured out how you're going to structure all your data in S3. This comes up and it's like, oh, bugger, I need to do everything again. Oh, environment. Previously, it was really hard to find out Dynamo table names and S3 bucket names and prefixes. I think that's now been solved from what I saw yesterday. We use the serverless framework. Um, it's really good. 
We were stuck on version 1.4 or 6 or 7 for varying reasons, 2 point whatever's come out now, which is even better, but I had trouble figuring out the environment variable part of it, so we didn't use it. That's all. Data's really hard. Awesome, thank you, Tim. So we have time for a few questions. Are there some questions? We got one right here. Hey, um, how do you stop your costs from spiraling out of control if against a DDoS attack of an unauthenticated Lambda? <laughs> Trust you to ask that, Devin. <laughs> so here's something I prepared earlier. So Amazon has a couple of ways to deal with this that I've heard about, but we didn't use. So first, in front of S3, you can use CloudWatch, which automatically distributes all of your stuff around the world and has DDoS protection built in. So again, oh, CloudFront, sorry. Oh yeah, CloudWatch is something quite different. CloudFront. <laughs> Through API Gateway as well, you can also write rules to filter requests. We didn't do that, so I don't know much detail about it, but I saw it in a presentation by Amazon once. The Lambda calling direct, we only let authenticated users who have authenticated through Cognito ID to do that. Sorry, authenticated through Cognito. So if someone's doing a DDoS attack, we'd need to have some level of registration from them, and I guess we could kill that Cognito ID and delete it. Then they could re-register and do it again. So that probably is a risk for this calling lambdas direct. On the upside, it will only make your cost spiral out of control. Your system should keep working fine. <laughs> <laughs> Although you'll probably hit your Dynamo read and write query, um, availability per second quite quickly. Nice. Uh, one more question. All right. There we go. Speaking of DynamoDB, have you tried to uh, while querying using primary global indexes, second, secondary global indexes, I found quite inconvenient that you can't create primary second indexes when your database already created. So on one of our tables, we did have a primary and secondary index. So I'll just give a bit of context for the question. So DynamoDB, really fast if you're querying on a primary index. You can create a secondary index based on, here's something I prepared earlier, based on a value in another column, maybe deep in a JSON blob. And you can give it a read and write per second for that secondary index. So you pay for the secondary index like it's a separate table and query it like it's a separate table. And I've forgotten what your question was. Uh, my question was, uh, have you tried it and uh, have you found it convenient? And, uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, so our use case, we had the Cognito ID um, to look up a table. We also needed to look up by customer number for queries coming through the API gateway. Because Cognito ID is long and horrible, and customers, we wanted to give a nice, simple number. So we created a secondary index on that column for customer number, so we could do a really fast lookup rather than a table scan. And it was good for that use case. For complex indexing, maybe you've got a table of CDs doing an index on the track title for track three, I didn't try that kind of secondary index. We didn't have a use case for it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tim. If everybody can just give a big warm round of applause to Tim.